If you have your Bible, open to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Have you enjoyed this Thrive series? Talked about getting out of the boat, but then there's some boats you're supposed to be on. There's just some people not supposed to be on them with you. So you got to throw them off the boat. Well, we're going to continue with this today. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. Their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Let me pause right there for a moment. I want you to notice the children had been taken captive. The wives had been taken captive. The only hope left was the men. And I think we got to get back to a place where we stop depending on just the women to do all the breakthrough and all the women to do all the praying and all the women to do all the praise. And it's time an army of men rise up again and say, devil, you're not going to take my marriage captive. You're not going to take my children captive. You're not going to take my city or my nation captive. We need an army of men to rise up and say, we're willing to fight, devil. You picked a fight with the wrong people. And then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and they wept till they had no more power to weep. Go down to verse 6. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself or strengthen himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring an ephod to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? Some of the greatest faith in your life will be exercised from the time you pray to the time you get an answer. And you have to be obedient because God answers three ways. Yes, no, maybe. And you have to be obedient no matter how bad you want to go after it if God says no. And if you're afraid and you're nervous, you got to be ready when God says yes. But then you have to have the faith and patience when God says, maybe. But on this one, God said, pursue. For you shall surely overtake them and without fail, recover all. I came to speak a word over people's lives today. And this is the word, pursue. For you will surely overtake and without fail, you will recover all. If you receive that, give Jesus a big praise in this room. So I've entitled this message, Thrive, from victim to victor. From victim to victor. You, should all, you could also call it from victim to victory. There are two people in this room. There are victors. And there are victims. Now, I was reading about, this wasn't a big deal when I was growing up, but it has become a bigger deal in this current generation, in this current culture. It's a, it's a real phenomenon called victim mentality. Victim mentality. And the, the way you identify a victim mentality, here's a couple characteristics. Their motto is, Bad things just happen to me no matter what I do. If I do good, bad things happen. If I do bad, bad things happen. No matter what I try, no matter what I do, bad things just happen to me. Now, I will preface the rest of this message by saying this. There are people in this room that have had some bad, terrible things happen to you. Terrible things. 
And if you, if you don't believe me, just sit down with some, some folks in this room and say, tell me your story. And they'll tell you a story of terrible things that have happened. That's not what I'm using to identify victim mentality. It's the second part. Pay attention. I can't change what happens, so there's no point in trying. Now, that's what I want to zero in on. I can't change what happens, so there's no point in even trying. And you have settled in to the seat of being a survivor, living with a victim mentality the rest of your life. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can change. So there's no point in me even trying. Here's, the, here's some of the phrases you'll hear people with a victim mentality say. Tell me if you recognize any of these. Not, not from the people sitting next to you. Just people not in the church. If you recognize any of these. They put themselves down constantly. But every time they do, they just say, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Constantly putting themselves down. Constantly making themselves the butt of a joke. But uh, No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. They say things like this. I don't look forward to anything about the future. They believe every day is going to be another day of trouble. Every day is going to be another day of sorrow. Every day is going to be another day of trials. There's nothing good in the future to look forward to. How about this? They are angry or resentful of other people's blessings. This is a victim mentality. When somebody else gets blessed, they get angry. When someone else gets blessed, they get resentful. They're the ones standing on the sidewalk out front in front of church watching to see what people drive in. They don't deserve a car that nice. They don't deserve a family that pretty. He shouldn't be married to a woman that pretty. They don't deserve a house like that. He doesn't deserve that promotion. And they get angry when someone else is blessed. Victim mentality. Here's another part. Same negative stories over and over and over. I mean, when they start into it, you could finish it because you've heard it 57 times. And you're like, let me stop you there. Let me go ahead and finish it. I know how it ends. It's terrible. They did you wrong. I get it. This one hit me hard. Listen to this. Self-pity and a strong sense of entitlement. I am so pitiful. I am so, I'm so pitiful, so you should pay me. You should pay me for my pitifulness. They owe me. My family owns, owes me. My city owes me. My church owes me. My government owes me. Everybody owes me. I'm entitled because I'm a perpetual victim. Preoccupied with past traumas. I shouldn't have started out with this. I should have saved this for the end, right? Good thing we got the offering first. Preoccupied with past traumas. Can't get over anything that happened in the past. Just relive it every day. Here's, a, here's one. Uh, if you recognize anybody like this. Believes everyone else has it easier than they do. <laughs> Nobody's got it as hard as I do, honey. Ask three people down your row. Somebody's got it harder than you do. And this is a problem we got as Americans. We believe life is so hard in America because most of us have never been to a third world country. We don't know what hard really looks like. We don't know what difficult, we don't know what it is not to have fresh water in our village and have to be dependent on a missionary to come dig a well so that we can get fresh water for us and our children so they'll stop drinking a polluted sewage water that's running down the river and we're sick all the time. We got it good, folks. Can somebody say we're blessed? I'm not saying you're not going through anything bad. I'm just saying victim mentality will make you believe you've got it worse than everyone else. And then I read this, and this, I had to sit back, and I went, oh my goodness, I'd never heard this before. A victim mentality is a type of learned helplessness. 
learned helplessness. Remember being a kid? You believed anything was possible? You believed you could do anything? Give you a cardboard box? You thought you could make it into a rocket and go to the moon? Anything was possible. But then somewhere in your life, maybe it was your education system, maybe it was your community, maybe it was family, maybe it was mentors or coaches, somebody came along and told you why you couldn't do it and why you couldn't succeed. It might have even been a church telling you why you'll never amount to anything, why you'll never be successful, why you'll never accomplish anything great. And what they taught you, they helped you learn how to be helpless. They helped you learn how to be a victim every day of your life. They got you into a mentality. Everybody's got it better than you. Everybody's doing greater than you. And they got you into a mindset. You better wake up every day praying. You just survive the day. This is not that type of church. We're going to unlearn your helplessness. Because let me remind you, there is a scripture in your Bible. I will lift up my eyes under the hills from which comes my help. I ain't helpless. My help comes from the Lord, the Lord which made heaven and earth. I'm not helpless. I'm not surviving this day. I'm going to thrive in this day. I know bad things have happened to me. The devil's doing his job. Of course bad things are going to happen to you. But regardless of what the devil's doing, he's a bad, bad devil, but I serve a good, good God. And my good, good God is going to cause all things to work together for my good. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. He has called me to be the head, not the tail, above only and not beneath. I am an overcomer in all things through him who loved me and died for me and gave himself for me. I'm more than a conqueror. I am triumphant. If I'm preaching anybody, give them a big praise in this house. Look at somebody and say, I will not be a victim. I will be a victor. Tell them all I see in 23 is victory. Victory for my life, victory for my family's life, victory for my city, victory for my school, victory for my business, victory for my father. All I see, don't get, don't think I'm gonna play the victim. Uh uh, I am victorious, not a victim. Here's the big idea this can either be your worst hour or it can be your best hour. It can either be your worst hour or it can be your finest hour. If it's your worst hour, that's victim. But if you're saying this is gonna be my finest hour, it's cause you got a victory spirit on the inside of you. I'm not a victim, I am a victor. So there is, a, there is an army by the name of the Amalekites that has come in to Ziklag. Now, I'm gonna give you a long history very quickly. How did this happen? What happened here? What's going on? David has been on the run from Saul. God has brought into David's life these men who were, who were vagabonds. They were desperate. They were poor. They were in poverty. They had nothing. But when they got around David, the giant killer spirit in David got into them. And your Bibles changed their name from desperate in poverty to mighty men. That's what happens when you get in the presence of a giant killer. The spirit of the giant killer gets on the inside of you. You ain't a victim anymore. You're a victor. And so David, he could have killed Saul, King Saul, many times. But he didn't do it because he respected God's anointed. And so he's on the run from Saul. Saul is actively trying to kill David. So David, he finally goes across enemy lines into the territory of the Philistines. And he strikes a bargain, makes a covenant with the Philistines. The Philistines. These are the people that David has spent his life whipping. And now he has cut covenant with them. And they said, if we ever need you, David, you come fight with us. He said, okay. And they said, we're going to give you a city. You can take your wives, your children, the men, their wives, their children, and you all can go and you can find peace in this city. It's your city. We're giving it to you. The name of the city is Ziklag. 
Ziklag. Well, one time the Philistines had an enemy, a battle they had to fight. So they call on David and his mighty men. You promised us you would help us. And so off they go out to battle. While David is out to battle, the Amalekites come in. And the Amalekites, what makes the Amalekites unique is they go after your weakness, not your strength. The Amalekites never face you head on. They're always coming where you're not looking. So when you leave one thing unguarded, the Amalekites go after that. So you say, where did these Amalekites come from? Well, I'll tell you where they came from. Let's go even further back in history. God gives Saul a command, King Saul. He said, I want you to go down and I want you to defeat the Amalekites. I want you to kill the king. I want you to kill the soldiers. I want you to kill the entire families. I want you to even kill the livestock. Leave no one alive. A few days later, Samuel, the prophet, comes riding into town. And he says, Saul, what is the bleating of sheep and goats that I hear? And Saul said, oh, it's okay. I brought back the king. I brought back some of the people. I even brought back the livestock because I'm going to offer them as a sacrifice unto the Lord. And Samuel looked at him and said, obedience is better than sacrifice. God told you to slay them on the battlefield, not bring them back here as an offering. And Samuel, man, he's a bad dude. He pulls out a sword and lops off the head of the king and said, as the head has been removed from his body, so has the kingdom been taken from you, Saul. And now there's an army that has come back and it has attacked the women and it has taken captive the children. What army? The Amalekites. The Amalekites represent the enemy that the previous generation failed to deal with. And there are some of you leaving Amalekites that your children are going to have to get free from. There are some of you leaving Amalekites of addiction, Amalekites of bitterness, and because you won't defeat this enemy of bitterness, you're going to let your children be taken captive by bitterness. And because you won't defeat this, uh, this enemy of fear, you're saying, I'll leave it, to your, uh, leave it to my children, and fear will take my children captive. What I'm preaching today is to this generation, it's time you deal with your Amalekites so your children don't have to. It's time you get a hold of the Spirit spirit of fear, the spirit of perversion, the spirit of addiction. Get a hold of it now so that they can grow up in freedom and not have to fight the same devil you had to fight. Oh, if I'm preaching in this room, give Jesus a big praise. Here we go. Now I'm going to speed up. Your enemy's going to fight you in 3D. 3D, 3D, 3D fight. The first D, distraction. The devil can spot complacency. And here's what will happen. You say, when will the devil fight? Oh, the devil will fight me when I'm at my lowest moment. Uh-uh. He will wait till your highest moment. Because when you were at your lowest moment, you were praying, you were fasting, you were in the word, you were worshiping, you didn't miss a church service. Why? Because you were desperate for a breakthrough. But once you got your breakthrough, you don't pray anymore. You don't praise anymore. You don't get in the word anymore. You ain't got time for church anymore. That's when the devil hits you is when you lay your weapons down. You are more vulnerable after a victory than you are before it. So let me say again, how did David, come on folks, how did David get a city in the land of the Philistines? Goliath was a Philistine, remember that one? Goliath is the champion of the Philistine. David whipped him, cut his head off, and then moves into his neighborhood. How do you get to a place where you can build a city in the land of your enemy? And how do you cut a covenant with your enemy that I will fight with you? I'll tell you how. David got tired of running. I'm tired of spending every day of my life running from Saul. So if my own family's trying to kill me, I'll go into covenant with my enemy, 
just so I can have a break. Be careful of the decisions you make when you are tired. Let me, can I bring it home like this? Let me, let me change the subject just for a moment. It's, it's somebody told me, whatever you do, whatever you do, don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry. Is that truth? Why? Because that food will talk to you. Those little orange hostess cupcakes, they talk to me. None of the other ones, those little orange coat and those little Intamin donuts with the chocolate icing, talk to me. It's all in that section too. That's, that's my people over there. The cupcakes, the, the donuts, that's, that's, that's my people. So don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry. Be careful the decisions you make when you're tired. When you get tired of looking for a job, you'll take the wrong one. When you get tired of looking for a spouse, you'll marry the wrong one. When you get tired of fighting for a marriage, you'll give up on the right one. And every day of our life, we make bad decisions because the devil got us tired. He's not always out to defeat you. Sometimes he's just out there to wear you out. You know what your Bible says the devil does? He wears out the saints. And he is out there to wear you out. Because if he can wear you out, he can get you cutting covenant with what you used to fight. I'm preaching. Esau sold his birthright because he got tired. Samson sold his secret because he got tired. Elijah prayed, God, let me die because he got tired. When you get tired, you'll give up your birthright blessing. When you get tired, you'll give up your strength. And when you get tired, you'll sell out your purpose. The second D, discouragement. Oh, I don't know who I'm preaching to. But I mean, here you have been out there fighting. And you get a victory. But listen, even victories come with a cost. Even when you get a victory, you're bleeding. Even when you get a victory, you're bruised. Even when you get a victory, you're exhausted. And here you've been out here fighting the enemy and you're tired. And so all you want to do is go home. And as you go home, you're waiting on the women to come out and greet you and the children to sing your praises. And you're waiting on this parade and celebration. But as you approach, you notice there's nothing but silence. And then you see the smoke rising out of the city. Ziklag is when you've been fighting over here, but the enemy's been hitting over here. And you just can't seem to get victory. You fight in this place only to turn around and there's something on fire over here. And when you get this fire put out, something else starts up over here. Ziklag is when you can't find the direction of your victory. Father figures, Jesse, I don't have time to go into it. Why was David a young little boy out on the shepherd's field? Well, there is a belief that Jesse put him out there because David was born of, of adultery. And so he was, he was, Jesse was trying to cover up his sin. So he put David out in the field knowing he'd be attacked by lions and bears, hopefully wiping away his mess. His first father abandoned him. And then he finds another father in King Saul. And surely King Saul, he welcomes him into his home. He makes him a general in his armies. But then jealousy got a hold of King Saul. And now jealousy has Saul throwing javelins trying to take David's life. His father figures have failed him. His brothers have turned on him. Read what happens when David gets to the battlefield with Goliath. Watch how his brothers talk, talk to him with disdain and anger. What are you doing here? You nosy little boy. You just came to see what the men were doing. His brothers have turned on him. Here's the big idea. The enemy is looking for a wound that hasn't healed. He will use the father that walked out on you to hold you captive in a victim mentality the rest of your life. He will use the parent that left you to hold you captive the rest of your life. He will bring that one instance back up in your mind over and over again where you were betrayed, where you were talked about, where you were, where you were ostracized and where you were, where, where you were put off and put down. And he will use that to get into your life over and over and over 
because he's just trying to hold you in the mentality that you are helpless and you'll never be able to change it. Am I preaching? Let me keep going. 3D, the third D, disagreement. Now his friends are ready to fight him. The men weep until they cannot weep anymore. Have you ever cried to the point you physically can't cry? That's pain. That's trauma. That's heartbreak. I've been there. As a pastor, I've seen people go through it. We've gone through it as a family. You weep until you have no more strength to weep anymore. And when you have finally cried long enough, you will look for someone to attach blame to. You did this. And they turn on David. Disagreement. This is what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to attack everyone who's not your problem. I heard this story. I've told some of you before. I heard this story about these, these two old men. They were sitting up in the stands watching a bullfight. And that matador walks out and he shakes that red cape and that bull charges that red cape. That matador spins around. He flicks that red cape. That bull charges that red cape. And one old man looks at the other old man and he said, if that bull ever figures out who's holding the red cape, that skinny fella's in a lot of trouble. And what I want to say to the church today is if you would ever figure out that the devil's just holding a red cape making you think this is the problem they're the problem that's the issue and you would say hold on I ain't fighting you I don't fight flesh and blood but I fight spirits and principalities in heavenly places I'm gonna instead of running after the red cape I'm going after the devil holding the red cape so they pick up stones and they pick up a stone of doubt. And when that stone of doubt hits me, it makes me question my calling. Is this even what I'm called to do? Have you ever been there? Then the stone hits you of insecurity. It makes me question my anointing. Did God even bless me or empower me to do this? And then the third stone hits you and that's the stone of fear. And the stone of fear keeps you paralyzed. I, I know somebody, they're going through a struggle with a, an issue in their brain. And what happens is if their blood pressure gets too high, it causes this nerve to activate in their brain. And he said, he said uh, decades ago, before they had medicine to treat it, they called it the suicide disease. And he said, the pain is so terrific. He said, it's so awful. That you just, he said, it's, it's terrible. And, and he said, I'm having to take anxiety medicine. I said, why? He said, because I'm afraid of the next attack. And that's when the stone hits you. You're afraid of trying. Because what happens if the devil hits you again? And what happens if you get abandoned again? And what happens if somebody walks out on you again? And David has lost his family. And David has lost his fortune. And David has lost his friends. And now the group of men have surrounded him and they're all looking at David. Here's the big idea. You are on display. When you go through a storm, you are on display. Because anybody can listen to you talk about, oh, the Lord is good. His mercy endureth when everything's going good in your life. You can talk to people about how great your church is and all oh, my church just bless me, change my family when everything is going good in your life. You can sing songs, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, when you have provision in your life. But when you go through a season where the provision dries up, all the people who want to see if you really believed what you were singing and really believed what you were preaching, They'll start staring at you. You're on display. What I've come to tell you is you are at your greatest moment of faith, not when you're on top of the mountain, but when you're in the lowest part of the valley because that's when you get to say, this thing is real to me. I wasn't singing it just because everything was going good. I was singing it because in the good times, he's God, and in the bad times, he's God. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He ain't just my shepherd when he's feeding me and clothing me and making me lie down. No, he is with me when I'm in the very shadow of death. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Am I preaching anybody in this room? Oh, take three seconds and give him a big praise. This thing's about to take off. I need somebody to look at somebody and say, I will not survive. I will thrive. Survive. Victim. To continue to live or exist in spite of. Well, I just got to make it through another day. Well, I just got to make it through another week. I got to make it through another year. But to thrive, to flourish, to prosper, to succeed, to grow, to expand, to advance, to soar, to excel, to prevail, to recover all. To recover all. I'm not going to sit down and cry myself to sleep every night wondering I can't do anything about it. I can't change anything. No greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And devil, you may have beat me down to my lowest point, but I'm about to stand up. You haven't seen me fight yet. I will thrive. I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. Keys to victory. Keys to victory. Discern the times. Say that with me, discern the times. I gotta show you this, I'm sorry, I I take a little moment, let me show you this. So guess where David's gonna be crowned king? In Ziklag. Guess who's about to die at the moment all these battles are taking place? Saul is about to die, he's gonna kill himself on the battlefield. And that crown is going to roll and meet David in Ziklag after he's gone and whipped the Amalekites and recovered all. So why did this battle come that put David at his lowest moment, that had his men turning on him? He's lost family. He's lost fortune. He's lost everything. Why did the battle hit so hard? Discern the times, David. The crown's rolling in your direction. And the reason that the enemy has turned up the temperature is he wants you to give up just before the crown hits your head. He wants you to give up when victory is within reach. He wants you to give up when you are about to step into everything God had prepared for you. What was prophesied in Bethlehem is about to come to fruition in Ziklag and that's why the devil hit you in Ziklag because he wanted you to give up before you got the Second key to victory. Are you ready? Here it is. Encourage, not yourself. I need some attitude on it. Yourself. I need you to look at somebody and say, encourage yourself. Encourage yourself. Of course you can be encouraged in this atmosphere. Who can't? You got signs all over the place. Take the limits off. Anything is possible. You got Blake up here pumping you up to another level. You got an incredible team of musicians up here. And they're, I mean, who who couldn't be encouraged with all this? But what are you going to do when you don't have an organ? What are you going to do when you don't have a piano? What are you going to do when you don't have a praise team? What are you going to do when you don't have a preacher? What are you going to do when the church is closed and you can't get in? You've got to find a way to encourage Yo, get in front of a mirror and say, all right, buddy, let's talk. We're going to make it because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You are more than a conqueror. You are triumphant. You are above only. You are not beneath under him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that which we could ever ask or think according to the power that's at work on the inside of you. Now pick yourself up, walk out that door and go wreak havoc on enemy hell territory. Oh, high five somebody and tell them encourage yourself. Hallelujah. They all 
all got rocks. There's, there's little David. Before you throw up, fellas, let me just tell you, life's not been easy. My daddy didn't want me, so he put me out on a field hoping a lion would eat me. My brothers didn't like me. A giant made fun of me. Saul abandoned me. Now he's trying to kill me. Now the enemy took my wives and my kids. Life's been hard, man. No, he did not discourage himself in the Lord. He encouraged. You say, what does it mean to encourage? He did not rehearse his victimhood. He started rehearsing his victories. Yeah, my daddy put me out there, but when the lion came after the sheep, God delivered it into my hand. And when the bear came after my sheep, God delivered it into my hand. And when a giant was mocking my God, I looked him square in the eyes and I said, you come at me with sword and shield, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. And a rock put him on the ground and I chopped his head off with his own sword. And then they started singing, Saul has killed his thousands, but they wrote a new song, David has killed his tens of thousands. I'm not gonna sit around here and be a victim one more day. I got victory after victory after victory after victory after victory. I need somebody to take about 10 seconds. And I want you just don't rehearse the tragedies. I want you to rehearse the victories of God in your life. Has he ever healed you? Has he ever delivered you? Has he ever provided for you? Did he save you? Did he forgive you? Did he give you a new start? Did he wash your sins away? Did he write your name in the Lamb's book? I need somebody to take a moment and just rehearse your victories in the Lord. You say, what's that doing? I'm telling everybody around me, God did not do all that just to let me down now. God didn't bring me through all that just to let me be defeated now. If he, if he won it back then, if he won it back then, he's gonna give me the victory today. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Well, pastor, if I worship, will it change my situation? I don't know. It may not, but it'll always change you. And right now, what you need is not your situation to change. You need to change, and then your situation will change. And that's what worship does. Worship encourages you. Worship blesses you. Worship strengthens you. You've been in a season of tears. Has anyone had to cry this year? Tears of pain, tears of worry, tears of brokenness. Well, I'm here to declare over somebody. I told you I had a word. And that word is this. Weeping may endure for a night. Encourage yourself. Joy is coming in the morning. You may have went forth sowing seeds with tears dripping down your face. But honey, you're going to return carrying your harvest of joy in your arms. You are stepping into a season of reaping. You are stepping into a season of overtaking. You are stepping into a season where without fail, you will recover all. Look at somebody and tell them, this is my comeback. My worship is announcing my comeback. 
my worship is announcing it looked like I was up against the ropes it looked like it was over and done but my worship is telling my enemy this is my comeback I'm standing up I haven't even begun to fight yet I'm making my shout is declaring my season is changing my shout is declaring my season my shout Your season is changed. This can be your worst hour or this can be your best hour. This can be your worst hour or this can be your finest hour. I am not a victim. I am a victor. And all I see in 23 is victory. talking to the single mother today. I'm talking to the man struggling at work. I'm talking to the broken marriage. I'm talking to the struggling teenager. Ziklag is not your end. Ziklag is not the end of your stories. These stones are not your end. These haters are not your end. There is a word from the Lord over your life. Pursue and without fail, recover all. You know what that means? God just gave you the green light. You got the green light. Don't wait on somebody else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody remember that game? Red light, yellow light, green light. What did you do on green light? You went, you didn't go backwards. You went forwards, and you may have walked backwards coming into this church, but you are walking forward going out of this church, and there's only one direction with your name on it, and that's the enemy's camp where he's got my stuff. I will pursue, I will overtake, and without fail, I will recover all. Give Jesus a big praise in the room today. Hallelujah. Let me say this and I'm done. You can, you can remain standing. I'm almost done. I've learned something about the devil. The devil is a liar and the father of lies. But he makes you believe his lies by telling you a half truth. He takes a little bit of truth and a whole lot of lie. And he gives you a half truth. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Finish the devil's sermons. He's only preaching halfway. Go ahead and finish it. You'll never amount to anything. In myself, I'm not anything. But Jesus in me, I can do all things. Nothing is impossible to me. You'll never get through this battle. I'll never get through this battle on my own, but I'm not alone. I got one who sticks closer than a brother, and he told me to speak to this mountain. And if I speak to it, it would be moved. What I'm saying is the devil's going to preach, finish his sermon. You're a victim. I was, but I'm a new creation now. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm a child of the Most High God. I'm a son or daughter of the King of Glory. He knows my name. He knows the number of hairs I have on my head. He knows every breath I've taken. He knew my name. He knew my calling while I was yet in my mother's womb. He's got me in the palm of his hand. Finish the devil's sermon.
You know what I'm praying today? That you'll receive this into your core. I want this to be one of those sermons that's not, not just a throw away, not something you forget two weeks down the road. I want this to change the way you think. Do you know what repentance, the word repentance means? To change your mind. And I wish we'd all repent and say, no, let this mind of Christ be in me. He was not a victim. Even all the way to the cross, he knew he was a victor. And he arose triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. And the same spirit that raised him from the dead is the same spirit that lives on the inside of me. I'm triumphant. I'm an overcomer. I'm a victor. And all I see in 23 is victory. Do you receive that word today? Tell Jesus you receive that word.